Before we get into today's video, I do want to let you guys know that this video is for educational purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope you all have had a wonderful week and I hope everybody is gearing up for a great weekend. So in today's video, we're gonna be talking about a pretty highly requested case and this is a case of 27-year-old Ellen Greenberg. Now this case is about 10 plus years old and it's incredibly fascinating in my opinion. I have read about this. I have looked at crime scene photos and evidence and read documents and gone over it and over it. And I just cannot hardly decide what I think happened. I'm teetering one way or the other. If you want to go over the like crime scene photos and some of the other information that I cannot put here on YouTube, we'll be doing that over on my Patreon channel, which is always linked down below. And it'll be under the $2 tier, which is $2 a month. And just real quick, if you guys don't know, I also have a Facebook, a Snapchat, and an Instagram, and all of them, as well as my second channel are linked down in the description box if you guys are looking for any other places to find me. So, what I'm gonna do in this video is like I typically do, I'm gonna tell you guys the whole entire story to the best of my ability, and then at the end, I'm gonna give you guys my opinion to the best of my ability, because this is a hard one, and, and you'll see as we get further into this. So let's just start at the beginning. Ellen Ray Greenberg was born on June 23rd, 1983 in New York City to her parents, Joshua and Sandra Greenberg. They were a very close family and Ellen was so very loved. She was an only child and her mom and her dad's pride and joy. Ellen's parents describe her as a happy child, a girly girl who liked all of the frilly things, loved spending time with her mom and had a bright future ahead of her. Hey everyone, I just wanted to pop in here and tell you guys some exciting news. So I now have two new TV shows on the Roku channel, Crime Report and Tales from the Inside. Tune in to Mysteria channel 548 to watch me break down crime cases with Crime Report and to share my personal experiences with Tales from the Inside. And there's so many ways that you can watch for free. You can go to the Roku channel.com and search for Mysteria or you can download the Roku app on your smart TV, which is how we have done it. Or if you have the Roku stick, all you gotta do is go to channel 548 on the live TV guide. See you all there. Ellen grew up, she finished high school, she went on to college, and as she was getting into the dating scene, in the year of 2007, she was set up with some friends to go on a blind date. The blind date was with a young man named Sam Goldberg. Sam was a television producer for NBC and later Golf.com. After a couple years of dating, they moved in together and Sam proposed to Ellen in June of 2010. At that time, they were living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and by 2011, Ellen Ellen was 27 years old and a first grade teacher. This was her dream job. Now Ellen with her big bright smile, her bright personality and her kind heart was one of the favorite teachers at her school. All of the kids loved her and she loved them as well. But even though Ellen seemed to have everything she could want, her dream job, a loving fiance she was about to marry, she had recently developed some severe anxiety. Her mom would actually say in an interview that she called them and asked them if she could come and move in with them. This was very strange seeing that Ellen was at her dream job. Again, she's with this man that her parents said she loved. Now, when her parents were asked about Sam, they said that they trusted their daughter. She loved him, so they loved him. Point blank, end of story. So it was very bizarre for her to ask her parents, especially the fact that she's engaged, getting ready to get married, could she come and move in with them? 
Her mother suggested that she see a doctor, a psychologist, or a psychiatrist. She told her parents that her severe anxiety was completely work-related. And then people were asked at her job if she was stressed out at work. The people at her job said that she was stressed out at work, but like every other teacher is, right? Like teaching can be a very stressful job. It's long days. You've got all of these kids that you're teaching and there's just things. I mean, every job has their stresses, right? So nobody at the school that worked with her seen like a severe anxiety that was more than normal or more stress than normal. But nevertheless, she followed what her mom told her to do and she made an appointment to see a psychiatrist. Her parents, although very supportive, were surprised by all of this. They had just gone on a vacation together a month earlier and Ellen seemed to be in great spirits. Ellen had even just sent out the save the dates for their upcoming wedding in August. Then on January 26 of 2011, a snow blizzard hit Philadelphia. Ellen was at school with the students at this point, and this prompted everybody to leave early. Ellen gathered her things. She left work. She stopped at a gas station. She filled her car full with gas, and then she headed to the apartment that she shared with her fiance, Sam. Now for this story to take a drastic turn, by 6.40 p.m. that evening, Ellen was pronounced dead in her apartment with 20 stab wounds. 10 of these wounds were to her back and her neck. There were also 11 different bruises on her body that were in different like healing phases. So they were older bruises. She had bruises on her arm, her abdomen, and her right leg. Ellen's fiance, Sam, told the police that at around 4.45 p.m., he had gone downstairs to work out when he came home and noticed the door was locked. When he couldn't get into the apartment door, he began to text Ellen and call her for her to let him in. The text messages that he sent Ellen said, hello, open the door. What are you doing? I'm getting pissed. Hello? You better have an excuse. What the F? Ah, you have no idea. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if I had just left my husband in the apartment and I tried to come back in and they're not answering and the door is locked, I'm immediately gonna start thinking something is wrong. But the way that these text messages were worded, in my opinion, almost sounds aggressive or I don't know, it's a weird tone, but let's keep going here. After she didn't respond to his text messages, Sam said he attempted to kick in the door. The latch on the door was the part that was locked. And you guys know the latch that's kind of like in hotels. That's the part that had the door closed where he could not get it open. Sam said when he kicked in the door and he turned into the kitchen and he saw Ellen that she was on the floor, leaned against the cabinet, there's blood all over the place, and he immediately called 911. Help, I need a everything now. I just, I just walked into my apartment. My fiance is on the floor with blood everywhere. What is the address? 4601 Flat Rock Road. Please come, help, 4601 now. 4601 Flat Rock Road. Is this a house or apartment? <laughs> Oh no! Oh no! no. Apartment. It's an apartment. What apartment number? <laughs> please hurry, Where please. She's bleeding from. She, I don't know. I can't tell. She's. No. <laughs> so you have to calm yourself down in order to get you some help. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She. Okay. I don't know. I, I'm looking at her right now. <laughs> she. I don't. I can't see anything. She didn't. There's nothing broken. She's bleeding. Ellie. You don't know where she's bleeding from, can you? Ellie, where the blood's coming from? It's, I think her head. I think she hit her head, I think. I think but it's all everywhere. Okay, it's everywhere. Okay, it's everywhere. Think she might have fallen. Do you know yeah. what happened? Uh, she, 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 she may have slipped his blood on the on the table. Her, her face is a little purple. My, my, I just, my, I went downstairs to go work out. I came back up. The door was latched. My fiance is inside. She wasn't. She wasn't answering. So. After about a half hour, I decided to break it down. I see her now just on the floor with blood. She's not, she's not responding. Okay, is she breathing? She, I, <laughs> look at her chest. I need you to calm down, and I need you to look at her chest. It's really I don't think she I really don't think she is. Listen to me. Someone's on the way. Look at her chest. Is she flat on her back? <laughs> she's on her back. Do I bring her? Look at her chest and tell me if it's going up and down, up and down. I don't see her moving. Okay, do you know how to do CPR? I don't. Okay, I can tell you what to do, okay, until they get there. I want you to keep her foot Oh, on her. God. Hello? 
Yeah, hi, okay. Are you willing to do CPR with me over the phone so they can I, get, I, I have to, right? Okay, so get her flat on her back, bare her chest, okay? You want to rip her shirt off. Okay, kneel down by her side. Oh, my God. Allie, please. Listen, listen, you can't freak out, sir, because you Okay, I'm trying not to. I'm trying not to. Her shirt won't come off. It's a zipper. Rip oh, my off. God. She stabbed herself. Where? She fell in a knife. Oh, no. Her knife's sticking out. Her uh, what? There's a knife sticking out of her heart. Oh, she stabbed herself? I, can't, I guess so. I don't know where she fell on it. I don't know. Okay, well, don't touch it. Okay, so, so I'm just, I just let her down. Here now? I mean, what do I do? No, I mean, you can't. If the knife is in her chest, it's going to be kind of hard for you to do CPR at this time. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Okay. When the police arrived, they pronounced Ellen dead at the scene. They knew she was too far gone and there was nothing that they could do for her. Once they started investigating, they found a knife set on the kitchen counter next to the sink and fruit on the other counter, so they determined that she may have been making a fruit salad. Everything else in the apartment looked clean and in its proper place. Nothing seemed to be missing. They also noted that there were no signs of a struggle. Ellen and Sam's apartment was on the sixth floor and the only way to get in or out was the front door or the balcony. Now remember, a blizzard was coming in this day, so when the police went to the window of the balcony and they looked out, they saw no signs of like footprints or anything like that. And you guys gotta look at these balconies. These balconies are very shallow. They're not big balconies. It doesn't seem like the type of balcony where you can jump from one room to the next. And again, the snow was not disturbed at all. So just to recap, Ellen was allegedly in her apartment by herself with the latch door locked, okay? Nobody came in the window from the evidence that was shown. The fiance allegedly left the room, went to go work out. He was gone for 30 minutes. That's it. When he came back and kicked in the door and found her with the 20 stab wounds, with 10 of them being to her back and neck. As the cops continued to investigate, they found three different medication bottles that were prescribed to Ellen. Xanax, Klonopin, and Ambien. There was also a notebook in Ellen's purse she was supposed to use to track her state of mind while taking her medications. They found her cell phone in the master bedroom and they saw where she had sent her last text at 3.47 p.m. to a friend. And when the neighbors were asked, they said they didn't hear any commotion coming from that room except for when Sam kick the door in. So when the investigators finished scoping out the crime scene, they deemed Ellen's death a end it all or a suicide. A few hours later, Sam's father ended up calling Ellen's parents to tell them basically what had happened. Ellen's mom answered the phone and when she did, she just could not process what she was hearing. Ellen's mom asked if there was an ambulance there and this is when she was told no, there was no ambulance. So you weren't able to come down right away? No. We, yeah. couldn't come. we didn't get word of any of this until late into the evening. There were mounds of snow. Snow plows hadn't come through. Who called you? The fiance's father. And I didn't know what he meant. I said, you know, where's the ambulance? And then he said, there is none. Because we won't need one? And then you knew? No, I didn't really. It, it, it was shock. Well, this yeah. is not what you expect to get a call from. You have a 27-year-old daughter who's engaged to be married and living in Philadelphia with her fiancé. Now, as you can imagine, Ellen's parents were distraught, confused. They couldn't understand anything. Other than Ellen's anxiety, they said that there's there would be no reason for her to end it all. As a matter of fact, they keep doing interviews, and they're the ones that have continuously tried to get this investigated because... It just doesn't make sense. So the next day, which was the same day of Ellen's autopsy, Sam's uncle and cousin took Ellen's stuff from the house. They asked the property manager if it was okay to go in, and she said she checked with the police if it was okay, and they supposedly said yes. She even asked if they were sure, and just in case, she had a video recording made of the state of the apartment before letting anyone in. Booked a cleaning service, and once all of that was done, she let Sam 
Sam's uncle and cousin enter. They allegedly took her engagement ring, car keys, her electronics, and more. But they didn't immediately give the stuff to Ellen's family. When asked, they said that they took her stuff for safekeeping. They did eventually give Ellen's laptops to the police. This is when they gave the car back to Ellen's family. Now, when Ellen's parents went through her car, they found the receipt for the gas that she got on the way home that day. And that's why they were even more like, why would she stop and fill up her car with gas if she was just planning on going to a par her apartment and ending it all? When the autopsy was performed, the medical examiner noted far more stab wounds than they originally thought Ellen had at the scene. Some wounds were only 0.2 centimeters deep, which could indicate hesitation from Ellen. They determined the chest wound was the fatal one and the knife used was the knife from the set in the apartment that was sitting by the kitchen sink. So after the autopsy, the Philadelphia medical examiner then deemed the death of Ellen a homicide. So now it's gone from the suicide to now homicide. However, the next day, the Philadelphia PD backtracked in their statement and said that the death of Ellen Greenberg has not been ruled a homicide homicide. Investigators are considering the manner of death suspicious at this time. When the police realized that now the death had been deemed a homicide, they went and got a search warrant so they could go and search the apartment, but then they had already realized that the place had been cleaned up. Everything had been moved out and the place had been cleaned. After the funeral, everyone gathered at Ellen's grandmother's house. And during this time is when Ellen's father, Josh, went up to Sam and said, you do know that you are the prime suspect, right? And it is said that Sam immediately started crying and went over to his mother for comfort. The day after the detective that gave the announcement that there may be like suspicious circumstances and it may not just be an ending at all, the day after he made that statement, he comes out with another statement and said that Ellen had been struggling with mental issues. They found out Ellen only had three sessions with her psychiatrist in which she said she hadn't thought of ending it all, but was really stressed about work and deadlines she had to meet. But she only had good things to say about her fiance, Sam. She stressed that work was her only stressor in life. And when Ellen's toxicology report came back, it showed low doses of Klonopin and Ambien. Nothing that they would consider alarming since she was prescribed those medications and seemed to be taking them appropriately. However, both of those medications do have side effects of like ending it all. And she was also on other medications that she was prescribed as well, including Zoloft, who is, which is also known to be a medicine that has side effects of thoughts of ending it all. I just want to throw this out there. If you were taking any of these medications under your doctor's care, I'm, I'm not trying to push you one way or another. I'm just talking about the facts or things that we know as of now. Then to make this even more weird, there was Phil. Phil was actually the security officer that was on duty at the apartment that evening when Sam allegedly went downstairs and asked him to open the door for him. Sam would later say that when he could not get the door open, he went down and got Phil to come back up to the apartment with him while he tried to kick the door in. But Phil would later come out and say that he never went back up there with Sam to kick the door in, that it was against company policy and he wouldn't do that. So that's very strange that Sam said he went down there, asked him to come back up, but he says he didn't come back up, but Sam says he did come back up. So allegedly Sam was all alone when he kicked the door in and broke this law. Then for another twist, in February of 2011, the case was reversed again and deemed back again a at this point, Ellen's parents were very upset and they even told the media, we are not going to give up until we get justice for our daughter. Justice for Ellen is what it's all about. Ellen was and is a person and she has rights as a person and we're going to fight for those rights. Ellen's parents immediately began doing everything that they could to get justice for their daughter, but unfortunately they hit a lot of roadblocks over the years and time has gone by without a lot of progress. Ellen's parents have done television interviews and they have just been so, so strong-willed about this. They've gotten other professionals involved. And I mean, no matter what actually happened to Ellen, 
These parents loved their daughter and they have made it their mission to try to get their daughter justice or really figure out what happened to her. And make no mistakes, they do not believe again that she ended it at all. So eight years later, in February of 2019, a newspaper called the Philadelphia Inquirer released a front page investigative report reviewing the suspicious circumstances surrounding the death of Ellen Greenberg. This brought more attention to Ellen's case than ever before, which put pressure on law enforcement. Then a Pittsburgh forensic pathologist who famously challenged the single bullet theory in the John F. Kennedy assassination reviewed the case at the request of the family and determined that it was strongly suspicious of a homicide. He said that some of those wounds that she had were just impossible for her to do herself. And then other experts started to chime in as well. The more notoriety that this case got, the more experts started looking at it and going, hold up, how could she do this to herself? A forensic scientist, Henry Lee, who testified for the defense in the O.J. Simpson trial, reviewed the case files and concluded the number and types of wounds and blood stains that he observed are consistent with a homicide case. One significant point of contention were the stab wounds that penetrated Ellen's brain. Dr. Wayne Ross wrote that the stab wounds to the brain and the spinal cord would have caused severe pain, cranial nerve dysfunction, and traumatic brain injuries. He also says that there's evidence that she was strangled and there was marks on the front of her neck from a fingernail. Multiple bruises under and on the side of her neck and bruises on her body are consistent with a repeated beating. Now the original medical report stated that there was no such wound. Then a former prosecutor with the district attorney's office said that these four key pieces of evidence prompted him to doubt that it was an ending of it all. He said that the large stab wound to the top of Ellen's head. He said that Ellen's body was found sitting upright, but that she had had blood dripping down the side of her face. He also brought up the fact that Ellen had bruises on her body that were in different stages of healing. And then also the fact that Ellen's fiance, Sam, said that he had broke the latch by kicking in the door, but then the evidence photos showed that the latch was still attached on both sides, the door frame and the door. Tom Brennan, a former state trooper for 25 years and the private investigator, the family hired almost a decade ago said that through depositions in a lawsuit, the family had discovered in 2021 that Ellen suffered a 6.5 centimeter wound to the back of her head after her heart stopped beating. The PI also says that they believe that she was hit or attacked in a, what they would call a blitz attack. And it happened so fast. And this is why they believe that Ellen did not have any defensive wounds. He said that to him, that there was evidence that the scene had been staged, that her body had been moved. And definitely the fact that there was blood dripping down the side of her face, but yet her body was found sitting up against the cabinets was just too suspicious. However, despite the blood soaked crime scene, and the stab wounds to the back of her neck and her head, investigators still deemed this an ending of it all and basically no foul play. Then the attorney general's office came out and said that there was additional evidence that was found that supports the ending it all theory. So it's back and forth, back and forth. Just imagine what these parents have gone through. There were texts that were found between Ellen and her mom that show what people believe to be Ellen being in a severe mental distress. And remember those computers of Ellen's that were turned in when the investigators went through them, they found all of these like searches from uh, Ellen's computer that would say things like painless ending it all or quick ways to end it all. But it's also weird because the original report says that nothing like that was ever found on Ellen's computers. But it's important to remember that the chain of command was broken before the police even got the laptops because... Sam and his cousin are the ones that turned the laptops in. It is said that Sam moved on and in 2014 he got married and he has kids and he has a family now. His uncle is also a judge. Now I saw different things online that said that about a year after the incident, Sam kind of pulled away from the family. You know, he basically, he had to move on and that the family was obviously still fighting and is still fighting to this day to find answers or justice. Now, a lot of people think that the reason why Sam pulled away is because he was guilty and he did all of this. And then there's other people that believe that the reason why Sam pulled away is because he found his fiance who he loved in this situation, you know, in this state, you guys heard the 911 call, 
you know, went to go do the chest compressions, even though you could tell that he did not want to, saw the knife, it was a traumatic experience, and that he just couldn't stay in that mental state. So there's differences of opinions that are out there. In August of 2022, just last year of me filming this video for you guys, the district's attorney's office announced that they are going to reopen this case, which... This is really hard because it seems like a lot of the evidence was trampled upon. They wrote it off as an ending of it all, and then they just let whatever else happen. They took their photos, they took the pictures of the crime scene, and they let whatever else happen. The thing about it is, is if Ellen did do this to herself, which dang, like, can you imagine? Did you see this, the wounds? I mean... If she did this to herself, her family is not going to be able to have peace because there's really going to be no way that they can prove it at this point. They should have investigated this the right way. And I really believe that the majority of this falls on the police department and whoever did it, if Ellen didn't do it, obviously that's the first person. And then the investigators, they really messed this up and have left a hole in the family's heart and anybody that knew Ellen and loved her. What do I think? I don't know you guys. If it wasn't for the medication, I would with, a, with, with hands down say somebody did this to her. I can't explain it though, because you think about the window and you think about the door lock. I mean, you can tell that the door lock had obviously been damaged, but you don't, who, who really knows? The medication is the only thing that leads me to go, it's possible. Now, I know the toxicology report said that she had low doses in her system. She was also a small framed young woman. There are different things can affect the system. I'm, I'm just not really sure. And I know that some of these medications can cause psychosis. However, when you look at the guy, Sam, those text messages that he sent her, in my personal opinion, it's to me, it was a tone of like they had been arguing before. Let, let's go over them again. Hello, open the door. What are you doing? I'm getting pissed. Hello, you better have an excuse. What the F? Ah, you have no idea. The you have no idea sounds like a threat to me. It makes me wonder what was going on. It also makes me wonder too why she was so depressed or why she had so much anxiety if at work it was nothing more than a typical work environment. Was she being mistreated at home? Did she take that medication? Did she have a, a break? Did all of these things come together in one? Or did he do this to her? I know that the 911 call, people are super suspicious of it, but like, if he is just a not, and I don't know him, if he's not a nice person, not a compassionate person, and he sees his girl there that has lost her life, and he does, he's like, I don't want to touch, I don't know. All of it, none of it makes sense to me. None of it makes sense. Could he have done it and went downstairs to the gym? Absolutely. Could somebody have come into the window one way or another? Sure. And threw some snow on top of their footprints? It's possible. The cops sure didn't investigate it the way that it seems like it should have been. But I, there, there's, there's all of these factors. I have really strong opinions on certain cases. And this is one of them that's like, I don't know, you guys. How sad, right? What a beautiful young woman. I mean, she looked exactly like her mom, in my opinion. I mean, I saw these photos of her and her mom together. And I'm like, man, she was like her mom's twin the only child, a sweet, sweet woman. She was trying to get help for whatever was going on with her. Maybe she was hiding what was going on, like a lot of people do when they're in certain relationships. So what do you guys think? Let's all pray that her family gets some sort of closure, some sort of answers so they can sleep at night. I'm sure that they will never fully move on or heal, but Hopefully they can get some sort of answers with the case being reopened. Y'all let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. Other than that, thank you guys so much for being here. I love y'all. Y'all have a great weekend and I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye.